I had gone to school for like three years and my parents paid like $80,000. And then now I'm back at my, I'm just at my parents' house in the room I grew up in and I'm just playing Call of Duty and I have no job. And um, that was not good or healthy. And I I also did this, the thing that everyone does. I applied to Blizzard and I applied to Naughty Dog and I applied to Valve and I applied to Epic. Nobody got back to me. You know, and now I'm just playing games. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they don't need, you know, and that was it. And it took a while for me to start applying to way more places, places I've never heard of. And that's how I started getting jobs. You're listening to the CG Spectrum podcast. CG Spectrum College of Digital Art and Animation offers specialized career training for the film and game sector. Join our hosts, career development manager Maxine Schnepp and CGS mentor Justin Mullman as they chat with industry experts doing cutting edge work in film and games. Now, on to the show. Hey everyone, welcome to the CG Spectrum podcast. I'm really excited because this week I got to talk to Jay Hill. He is a character artist in the entertainment industry. He is currently a lead character artist at Turtle Rock Studios and he has a very successful YouTube channel. That's probably where you might recognize him. He talks a lot about 3D character art, but also things like zebra sculpting, modeling, game art, and rendering. We had an awesome discussion, talked about things like staying open-minded about jobs, seizing potential opportunities, how he finds great satisfaction creating his own personal work i think you're gonna like it check it out i feel like i've been doing art in one way or another for as long as i can remember i was an only child and my dad is um kind of like a an apple computer enthusiast and he would get them and then um he would give me his hand-me-downs as now i know as a parent um i had a lot of energy and i couldn't focus on stuff so i think he just you know the fact that I could sit down on a computer for a long time probably gave them a break, a break. And I feel like I've been on that road ever since, honestly. Like when I see myself late at night just sitting on a computer doing stuff, I think I've been doing that kind of thing uh, forever. And so I kind of see that as an extension uh, of that time. And then just my love of movies and art and just, you know, what a computer kind of represents, like just being able to, to do things um, at home, like a gateway to so many things like you can really fuel your curiosity and I wasn't I wasn't very good at at school which is ironic because my parents were teachers and um, I'm sure they were so disappointed everyone thinks you know every time (laughs) someone thinks if someone hears that my parents are teachers you know they think oh you must be good at school and I was like no I don't know I think maybe it's a little bit of you don't want to do what your parents do but yeah that like rebellion uh, aspect of like maybe I just want to do the total opposite (laughs) yeah I just was yeah looking back it was so bad fortunately for me my parents were really supportive you know they never really got too frustrated or gave up on me like that i thought i was going to join the military seemed like something an adventure to go do it felt like something um probably that would give me value or something maybe i don't know so that was kind of my plan i just and they pay you to go to school that's like a nice thing and i thought and you could figure it out later and and i and you know the commercials were very good and the commercials are like you know, maybe you could do something with computers or some guy with a radar. I was like, that seems cool. I don't know. You know, I have no plan. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, I just want to go on some adventure or something. But yeah, my dad, I remember I was like at Fry's Electronics with my dad. And he said, um, you know, we saved up some money and you can just, you can just pick a school. Just go to, just go to a school. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as you want to do it. And I was like, okay, well, I think I'm going to go to an art school then. And he's like, okay. And there was this art school called the Art Institute of Orange County, which I confused with the art center, which is actually prestigious. And, uh, and the art Institute is not. And I thought, Oh yeah, art Institute, this is where real people go. Uh, and they had a game art program. And, uh, like I said, I loved movies. Like I thought in my, in my dreams, I was like, maybe I'll get to work at ILM one day or Weta or something and make one of these big magical movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it seemed like a difficult path to get there and like an unclear path. And I thought maybe I could go from games to movies or something. But that like it would be a way to learn how to do more computer art, more 3D modeling. I was doing 3D modeling in high school. That was introduced to oh, me wow. there That's uh, in, in a drafting. Yeah, in a drafting class uh, is where I first found a – he. you know, there's a version of it where you're doing 3D modeling. And then I, I kind of put it together that this is what's in movies and stuff and uh, became kind of obsessed with that. I, I introduced it to my friends. And like so they were – we were all kind of learning to make 3D models and render them and go, whoa, this is crazy, you know. 
So uh, I was really interested in that. So I just kind of followed my interest there. And I feel really lucky. The games industry and real-time art has like grown around me. Um, it's crazy to me to think that like, um, and I and I think about this when I talk to younger people too, asking me questions like, when I even went to school, ZBrush wasn't a thing and like normal maps weren't a thing. So in retrospect, I, I think to myself, what was I thinking? I, and I really don't think I was thinking that much. I was just following kind of an impulse of like, do more of this. This I'm curious about this. Uh, and then, as I say, I got lucky that things were around me where my uh, ultimate goal of going to work on movies kind of faded away. And it just became like riding this wave of everything that's happening. So interesting. And also I became disillusioned. I, I would get to meet people that were doing my dream job. And um, I would talk to them about it. Like, what's it like working at Weta or ILM or something? And, you know, the stories never lived up to the dream in your head, it's just which which is not really a reality. And, uh, and something I keep telling myself that like the, there's these big kind of um, influential things that helped form those dreams, like the Lord of the Rings movies and like the stories of when they worked on um, Jurassic Park or Terminator or something. There's these like pivotal moments in visual effects and then same in some games. Um, like when Blizzard becomes Blizzard or Valve makes Half-Life 2 and, make, and becomes, you know, becomes these big names famous for doing something. Uh, the more I, you know, went down the path of trying to do things like that and learning more and talking to more people, you know, I realized that some of those like ingredients, they're not clear, you know, when you're doing it, like the people that are working on that thing be, that becomes something iconic they're just people, they're taking a lot more risks than what happens afterwards. Once it's like, you know, that this company is well known and they make good things. I feel like there's kind of a, a change. So I've, I've just, I've been kind of trying to aim, it seems like a tough distinction to make, but I've been trying to aim for things that like are on the cusp or things that like aren't for sure yet, or things that, you know, people that are trying something new or take, you know, again, a little bit more risky. Cause I think mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's the magic I'm after is like being a part of that group that makes something cool, you know? Um, that that's kind of something that I've been trying to do then uh, as my career and um, utilizing the whole 3D modeling thing. And anyways, that was a long winded answer. <laughs> I don't even yeah, know you went through, what was I talking about? Yeah, you went through a lot, but I almost like imagine you like on the cusp of like an actual surfing wave, just like kind of staying on the edge the whole time. And that's so exciting. And I think sometimes you do have to take risks. Um, it's such a cheesy thing to say, but but it it really is true. Like in order to be at the forefront of something or to be well known in a certain area or field um, or to be teaching people um, like you do with your YouTube channel, you almost need to be one of the first or like an early adopter of something. So then people go yeah. to you for that, for that advice. And I think that's important. Um, just following along other people's tutorials all the time isn't necessarily going to make you like the next big thing. Like you kind of have to try something different, which, which I think is cool. Um, and having that, um, the support from your parents, I think, even oh, yeah, if you so didn't great. follow down their their footsteps, you know, just yeah. being allowed to draw or, you know, use the computer and like, um, you know, have access to that kind of stuff um, is, is huge. Uh, you know, I remember yeah. following a similar sort of path and not really knowing what I wanted to do, but just, yeah, finding the only, like one of the only classes I had good marks in was like yeah. a computer tech class and a photography class. And like, that was it. Like, <laughs> but yeah. you put those two together, like looking back and I'm like, Oh, it all made sense. Those are computers and like photography. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, video. Like, I, I mean, I wasn't making 3d models at the time, but, um, but still it's, you know, it, it's funny how those things kind of line up when you don't even realize that you're on that. Path yeah. Already. Yeah. Retrospect yeah. seems so much more clear, but it seems, totally random and lucky and yeah. yeah i'm glad i'm glad it's been working out you feel a little bit like you know like you feel a little bit like nomadic or something uh because there's just not the um seems like there's like the typical i don't know if typical is the right word but the path that uh understandably parents are like trying to lay out as, as well as teachers is like here's this thing like if you follow these steps and you go to these schools that are well known for doing things and you get this degree 
you can get into a career that has lots of spots that's solid and that'll be there and you could retire, you know, um, safer, I guess, like a more mm-hmm. well-trotted path that's laid out, laid out. And uh, when I was younger, you just think that's the only path. But I think a lot of us have heroes that are just off doing their own thing, like uh, musicians and actors and you know all these things that young people idolize. And uh, this kind of art thing, like making a living doing art, that just seems so sketchy. But you can definitely do it if you're open. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a lot more, you don't, there's no laid out plan. You just don't know what you're doing. Um, sometimes six months in the future. You know, you don't know what you're going to make. You don't know what your next job is going to be, but you get used to that. And it doesn't, it sounds weirder to say, but, um, you know, the fact that we can make a living doing the things we're interested in, um, yeah. is the, is the whole success mm. of it. I think no, nobody really knows what they're doing at the end of the day. Right. Like, and yeah, I think nobody that's, does. No. No. <laughs> and I think that's it. That's an important part of this podcast yeah. that I like to highlight is, is when I'm meeting people like you, um, you know, and talking to people who have these dream jobs and who are doing um, really cool things. And, and by the way, like you're one person that was recommended to us. Like I reached out to my students uh, and I said, you know, I'm looking for people to interview. Who's like a big role model for you? Who do you want me to talk to? And we'll try to get them on the show. And you're one of them. Um, and so you've kind of become that person that people are looking up to. And I think it's so important to just have that reminder of like, yeah, sometimes we're winging it a little bit. I'm sure now in your life you feel a little bit more secure or at least like secure in the, in the chaos in some kind of way of not knowing and Mm -hmm. being okay with it. But you know, that's such an important part that there's not always this like exact cookie cutter way of doing things at the end of the day to get that, that result that you want. Um, And even where you are now, like, you know, you're making content on YouTube, you're teaching other people, like you're making a lot of your own stuff. You're not just working in a studio um, and and like doing that grind and going home and that's it, Uh, which is totally fine too, especially if you have kids, like you said. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I have been doing for the last couple of years, been taking like YouTube more seriously. It seems like weird to say. Also, just when I say YouTuber, it feels super weird. Um, I love YouTube, by the way, as a thing. Like I definitely, I don't watch TV or anything. YouTube definitely is like a form of entertainment that I need to like make sure I'm not indulging into uh, mm-hmm. as well as trying to participate in a, in a meaningful way for myself. But mm-hmm. I kind of also look at it with personal work. So like for me and what I do, like personal work and YouTube kind of work together. And I did have, uh, you know, years of not doing personal work during like, just more tougher times in my life when I was younger, I had more things going on trying to figure life out and all the things you do. And there's, I think a lot of artists can relate. There's like a feeling of guilt sometimes, not for everyone, but you know, just of not um, trying to get better, not making personal work for yourself. I found anyway that, you know, growing up making art didn't have a thing to it. Um, And then it led me to college and like things were cool, you know, but then it did become, you know, it's a career and then you're told what to do. I'm not trying to make this sound too negative. It's not, but there is a different, there's a little bit of a, um, a new experience when some, when, you know, other people, it's your job. So other people are asking you to make something that you may not have chosen to make if given anything, which, which is fine, obviously. Um, but that's a different thing now. And so you're, you become a hired gun and uh, there's like qualifications on it. It has to be in a certain thing. It has to be done in a certain amount of time. I still remember the first time in mean, my first job and someone asked me when, uh, you know, how long it would take me. And I was like, I don't know, uh, this <laughs> long. And they just marked on a Google like sheet, you know, like, okay, character is going to be done right now. Right. Or like right here on this day. And I was just like, oh my God. Like it just felt so, oh, you know, yeah. until that point I'd never uh, had a deadline and, it took a while to adjust with that, but I definitely wanted to try to get that magic back. Magic seems like a weird word, but I wanted to enjoy it um, personally and um, hone my craft and everything. That's another feeling is like, you know, if you're someone that wants to create things and they're not coming out the way you want, or it's more uncomfortable or it's more of a struggle than you wish it was, you know, it's because you need to work on those things. You need to work on some things so that it can, it can become enjoyable to to try and do the things you want to do. So mm-hmm. when I finally got to a place where my life settled down in a way where I can make be some sort of consistency, um, I wanted to do that. And YouTube started as a way even for me to 
put a little bit of pressure on myself and be, kind of be responsible to other people. So it was a way that I thought I could give back because I, you know, tutorials were huge for me. Um, definitely information is more readily available now, but those few people that were making awesome tutorials, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, changed a lot of people. It was great. And so this idea of sharing knowledge and not being, you know, not keeping anything a secret and trying to encourage other people, I wanted to perpetuate that. And also it was a way where if I did it in front of people and then people started being interested enough to say, when's the next thing or, you know, can, you know, whatever there was, I felt a little bit more beholden. Um, so yeah, and I thought it would be a positive way to kind of like, uh, keep that going. So I've been doing that now more seriously for a couple years. Um, and I think it's really important to do just, you know, this is how I kind of made it work with my own thing to like get that motivation, um, try and help people. So uh, essentially putting more things on than just, and uh, you know, me practicing hands or something, which I do, but, uh, also trying to do something that, uh, could pass along some info, um, be bigger projects, a little bit of pressure, all that stuff. But, um, but making personal work, I think is really important. So there's lots of little things now through the channel and through the other teachings that I do that I try to, you know, messages I try to push onto people that are interested. And I do think that doing work for yourself that you're interested in following your curiosity, you know, trying to enjoy it, uh, is just really important. Um, something that maybe even is, not I don't know if it's as common or what, but definitely a lot of people that reach out to me and maybe because the motivation is more strong, they want to know how to make money or how to turn it into a career. And that's a whole thing that, you know, we, we chatted about too. I think that we see eye to eye on. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things I want to do with the channel um, is kind of live by example that I'm making art just to make it, um, trying to enjoy it, trying to enjoy the process and then make something and go, cool, I made something and then move on. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and anyways, so that's kind of my long rant about why I make <laughs> personal work for the last, last couple of years. Hey everyone, quick shout out to CG Spectrum for helping make this podcast happen. CG Spectrum is an online animation, VFX, digital painting, and game development school that prepares you for a career in film and games. Whether you're just starting out or you're upgrading your skills, get personalized career training and mentorship from industry pros who have worked on blockbuster films and best-selling games. Courses are 100% online and you can choose from one-on-one -on -one private mentorship options or group classes with just four students max. You'll also get access to career support services and join an awesome community full of like-minded creatives just like you. Learn more at cgspectrum.com. We're bringing the industry to you. This is a common theme that like, I wasn't expecting uh, from some of the other people that I've interviewed is almost this need to catalog things for yourself or like make sense of of issues that like aren't working well it's like like you said you're like oh i'm really struggling with this thing and sometimes the best way to do that but you don't really have an opportunity uh to do research and development at your main job mm -hmm. like in a perfect world and some of the best studios in the world they do actually like carve out time for more research and development but we know yeah. that that's not always possible um and so like taking that time on the side for yourself to like practice something like oh that's that's better because yeah if you do something 10 times you're going to be that much faster on the 10th time than you were the yeah. first time whatever yeah. it is that you're doing if you know you're riding a bike or making a character or doing like some kind of groom on that character it's like the first time you did that i'm sure it took forever and it was kind of bad yeah. you know yeah. and now it's like you have your techniques it's a little, little bit better, better now it. but it's yeah, a little bit better still, a little bit but <laughs> still, still, working yeah, still yeah, working yeah. on it yeah still working on it um did you find that you um like did you ever have the feeling of like why should I be telling people how to do that? Like, did you oh, kind of yeah. get that imposter syndrome of like, why would oh, anyone yeah. even want to listen to me? Or you kind of focused on like that, that personal learning and the YouTube was just giving you that pressure. You needed to actually get it done. Cause I'm someone that like, I need someone to tell me what to do or like, I'll just, bit, 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 I'll just like run in a field all day. If uh, yeah. No one stops me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting to try and think how I tricked myself into doing it to start because I started the YouTube channel and I made a couple of videos like a long time ago, maybe almost 10 years ago. You know, some of the influences on me were like at the time, um, 
it was big to do these Call of Duty videos where you would do commentary. That was one genre that got really big on YouTube. And I would, and a lot of people started following people that did that. And I followed some that were not the best players, you know? So that was, that was just this example of like, these people are just recording themselves playing games. And then when something cool happens, um, they play it back and they talk over it. And eventually their channels even could become like the gameplay is just going on and they're talking. It's almost like a podcast before podcasts were a thing. Mm -hmm. So I thought that could be a way is that like, I just could record myself doing art and then talking over it. So that was kind of the impetus. And also um, there's channels like MKBHD, if people are familiar with him, he's a, a tech reviewer that made his first video when he was like 10 years old and has just kept making them. And that's the beauty of some channels. Like, so I don't, I don't remove my old videos either. And I think it's, it, that could be another form of, um, if not motivation, example that someone can see, hey, this guy made art 10, 15 years ago, and he's still doing it. And he's a little bit better at it now. Makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's um, that's another thing I liked about it, that it didn't feel as official. You know, when I made my first course, that took a while and that took some extra pressure to think that like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, like like you do with the imposter syndrome, like you're just going to pretend, you're just going to fake it till you make it kind of thing. But YouTube didn't feel like that. YouTube feels, and still today, it feels more liberating that even if I mess up, um, like I made a, I made a work that I thought was a failure and I just made a video about that. Because as long as you're genuine uh, and you're being authentic with what you're doing, then you're, then it's good. You know, then, then it's fine. So you, if I can be authentic about not being sure about something, um, about being weak at something else or about, uh, enjoying a process or not enjoying a process. So I think it's all good. And it's all, uh, hopefully in a way, at least if I, I want to make entertaining videos first so that more people will watch them, um, that might want to try this stuff. And then for the people that do do some of this stuff. You know, I hope to like say some of the things that they're thinking, you know, that it uh, normalize some of it, um, the feelings that we have, and then also um, try to demystify, you know, some of the things that it's not all crazy ninjutsu or whatever that, you know, that it makes sense mm. if you do some of these things and uh, you can achieve what you want. If you, if you just keep trying practice and problem solve and, and not give up you'll get to where you want to be. Oh, I love that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I think you, you touched on an important point of, of how this medium maybe unlike your regular job, you know, working in games or film or, or commercials, whatever you're doing, like there wasn't really that room for failure, you know, like when you're actually working for a client, like you just have to get it done. It has to be right. Whereas on YouTube, yeah. it's kind of like, I can have fun. This could turn out terribly. And then I'll change the title to like, look at this bad model or like, here's what not yeah. to do, you know? And yeah, like, you kind of yeah. have that, that funness of, um, yeah. you know, it not having to be perfect. And yeah, people, people are, they're into that. And I love that you also save all of your videos. I appreciate that because one thing I love to do um, when I, I mentor people and I help people try to figure out their careers is I love, love finding artists um, and professionals who keep their old work yeah uh, because then we can look at like oh look at what they did five years ago yeah it's never as good as what they're doing now or 10 years ago even you know like looking up someone's art station or or youtube or whatever and and seeing that natural career progression i wish like nobody ever deleted anything um obviously i try to tell my students to like, curate their own work you don't want to exactly. put your like your you first project it. when you're like trying to to get yeah. your foot in the door. But once you have that job, I wish more of those senior level artists, the people that have more job security, you know, they probably don't even have recruiters looking at their art station accounts because they're like they're they're getting hired based on their like legacy and like stuff that they've done and people that recommend them. Uh, I want to see more of that, like, what was the first thing you ever did? Um, yeah. So speaking of which, tell me a little bit more about your very first job, because we know what you're doing okay. now. You're doing mm -hmm. some really exciting stuff now. But I want to know a little bit more about, like, how you got there. What was your very first job in the industry? Was it cool? Were you working on a AAA game? What were you doing? It definitely was not cool. It was interesting. When I was at this school, this art institute, which, by the way, has recently, like, been closed down because they're, like – fraudulent and been taking people's money and they're not a good school at all. And it's terrible. But, you know, we went through the program before that was uh, well known. And at the time there was a, um, 
what would you call it? Academic director or something, you know, her job was to try to get people out and get them hired. So she was really trying to do that. And one of the ways she did it was statistically, there are more environment art jobs, prop jobs, whatever you want to call them, like making mm -hmm. models for games. Um, characters, you know, there's not that many. So that was kind of one of her um, strategies was like, let's just make all these people environment artists. And I was just, I just cared about characters. And, uh, and so I just didn't listen. And then I also thought that would be a strength that at this grad show, I would be like the only character artist, you know, Hey, who else are you going to get? You know? So I thought that was smart. And uh, also like at my school, um, by the way, I wish I had, you mentioned about having your early work. I do wish I kept my high res, like original portfolio. I've only, I've snagged like low res stuff, but I hate that. Cause there was times where I just deleted it and I'm like, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not the past. And now I'm like, I wish now I'm nostalgic about that. Mm -hmm. And I wish I yeah, had, you don't it. have to like show it publicly, but save it yeah. somewhere. I feel the yeah. same way about all of my like really terrible MySpace photos. When I yeah. You got to keep those. I wish I had all that stuff I did. And I, and I'm <laughs> now I'm better about it, but yeah, that would have been cool to have. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, I'm not tooting my own horn again. There just wasn't a lot of competition, but some people saw my portfolio that I'm going to school with and they were like, wow, that's pretty good. So I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is pretty good. Um, and it didn't work out. I didn't get hired at the grad show, but then I also didn't get hired for months after. So I had gone to school for like three years and my parents paid like $80,000 and then now I'm back at my, I'm just at my parents' house in the room I grew up in and I'm just playing Call of Duty and I have no job. And um, that was not good or healthy. And I, I also did this, the thing that everyone does that I, I'm sure you talk to your mentees about too, that like I applied to Blizzard and I applied to Naughty Dog and I applied to Valve and I applied to Epic. Nobody got back to me. You know, and now I'm just playing games. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they don't need, you know, and that was it. And it took a while for me to start applying to way more places, places I've never heard of. And that's how I started getting jobs. And so, yeah, this first job, um, I don't know if I just cold applied. I can't remember how it lined up. Someone may have recommended me, but I'm starting to think I might've cold applied. But anyways, it was interesting because when I walk in for the interview, I see people I go to school with. I went to, I went to school with two oh. people in there. And it was just some rented office in Orange County. And um, yeah, I did the interview and he, he seemed okay. So it was this guy who had this small company. Yeah, he just made the startup. I think he made some money with Blizzard. I think he worked on Ghost, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, um, he had enough money to start this little company and he would just do all these odd jobs. Uh, he would do these contracts, you know. And um, one of them was uh, some casino game. Needed a pre-rendered series of videos for like, if you get a jackpot, if you get whatever, and there's characters and it was themed like old timey. Um, so he needed character artists. So he contracted me. So it was myself and another character artist. And we got this couple month contract and, uh, and that was my first gig. And, um, yeah, it was weird. It wasn't for games. Um, I did Maya stuff. I did, I did grooming and I did, uh, like, um, mental ray rendering, which is super weird. Anyways, it kind of blew up in my face. It fell apart. The thing never shipped anyways, but I did get my money and uh, we kind of, we did kind of part on not great terms. So it was kind of a weird experience, but I did meet my, my first other character artist and he was pretty cool to me. He like took me under his wing a little bit. We went out to lunch and I asked him some questions. I remember like going to his house. And I'm like, wow, you know, like character art paid for all this. Like I live with my parents, you know, this is cool. Yeah. Uh, he had these like horror stories from working in films and I remember him saying like, you get overtime and you're like, Oh God, I'm so tired. And then triple overtime would kick in. You're like, I mean, the money's so good and you're just staying up making rocks. And I'm like, wow, that, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, but yeah. yeah, we kind of taught each other some things cause I, I knew Maya and he didn't. And then he'd been around the block. So he went to bat for me that we got a, like a second contract to extend that job and he got me a better rate. So that was cool. And then, um, that was my first gig. It was weird. Um, I learned a little bit more about the business, I'd say, probably some more about communication and then um, the whole work environment thing that was new. So I don't know. It was, it was, a, it was a weird experience, but I still remember that feeling of like being paid to make characters. And I did what I do now. And I try to do it in a, in a productive way where everyone's cool with it. That like, if there is something that I'm interested in anyways, that I could do and like, you know, spend this time to do that 
like investigate a new method or um, try a new technique or something. Uh, that feels cool to do that, like as part of your job. Like, hey, maybe we can mm -hmm. do this that I, I, I know a little bit about. You know, can we can we go down this path a little bit to see if we can try this? So it felt like I was learning and growing and trying things while it was my job, and that's that was great. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think enough people talk about the the fact that you know you could be doing something that isn't your dream job or it's not glamorous, but you still got something out of it. Like you said, like the project didn't ship. Uh, there was like weirdness happening. You weren't really working on anything like super fulfilling personally, but you learned about communication. You met some people, you realized that like some of your former classmates were there. So there's some like networking aspect to it. I'm sure that mm -hmm. that helped. And at the end of the day, did it help you get your next job? You know, and I think you said it did because maybe you, like, I think it actually rates. I think it did. Yeah, I actually think yeah. it did. Some of that stuff was in my portfolio. Oh, and you even got to use it for your portfolio. That's awesome. I did. I don't know if we officially <laughs> did that, but it was in there. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm putting it in. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting it in. <laughs> if it's not getting shipped, someone's going to see it. <laughs> yeah, um. yeah that, that's, that's funny. But yeah, it, it got me my next one. And my next one was kind of a cool one. That one was another small company, this time in Pasadena. I'd saved up a few thousand dollars while I lived with my parents still on this contract. And then I, when I got this first job, I commuted uh, for people that don't know. I don't know. It was like 45 minutes or an hour away. <clears throat> and then, so I did that for a few months and saved up money to move out. So that was my like, I'm moving out now and I'm floating on doing, but it was a really cool experience. I met someone there that I just, I just went to meet up with him last night. So it's been my longtime friend now. And I met him at this job. We ended up being roommates for five years um, he, he was looking for a place. That's how I, that's how I moved out. I moved in with this guy. He was like, uh, I'm going to look for a new place. And I was like, we want to just room up together. Uh, yeah. and so, yeah, so that was my first living out there experience. Um, and that was cool. All, all that stuff didn't ship again. Actually, it kind of did years after I left, but it was a weird experience, small company, work for hire in a really cool old building in Pasadena. And again, I got to live on my own and I was the only character artist. They're like, here, make the main character. And I'm like, wow, this is what I want to do. Thanks. You know, but like they had no better option and I got this cool gig for a while. <laughs> um, and they did, they had to do all these odd jobs to float the company. And some of them uh, were consulting with a game company in China. So I got to go for two trips and I was like the character art guy. And so each trip was like two weeks. So I got to go out to Shenzhen, which was developing at the time. And I got to see the world and everything. And I, I got this job by applying to just a forum post in the jobs thing in polycount.com, which was a big website um, for learning how to 3D model back in the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, yeah, um, yeah, I remember polycount. I think it's still a thing. Is it not I a thing I think it's anymore? still a thing. It's, it's just okay, not okay. as integral. ArtStation has taken over a lot of things that it did. Um, and there was just a, there was like a heyday in the poly count times where some of the famous dudes were posting whips and sharing info, but also it got so big that companies like these small companies that were in the know that knew about like, you know, the person who posted there was a modeler. So he knew about it and there was a jobs posting there. And so I, I, I replied with my website link and then he called this guy named Don called that day. And then I went down for an interview and yeah, totally changed my life. I remember being in China thinking, this is crazy that. I replied to a forum post and now I'm in China and that was really cool. So yeah, it, it changed a lot of things. And also there was like these old nerds. I don't think they care that I said that, but like there was these <laughs> older nerds there that it was the first time of meeting these guys, like guys that were like, that had played D and D a lot and like knew about all these games and like game design mechanics. And um, you know, they, they taught me how the prequel, the star Wars prequels, weren't good. And I was like, what? And they laid it all out for me. You know, like they just, they shepherded me into the culture and I was like, oh wow. And um, they gave me all these movies and books to read. It was a cool experience. Uh, so you I heard I it have, here first. Jay Hill's yeah. a Jar Jar Binks fan. <laughs> I, I am a Jar Jar Binks fan. I feel bad about that one, to be honest with you. But yeah, the prequels, um, <laughs> the, I, I, I didn't know that they were that bad, but yeah. A film critic can really rip those apart. I don't know if you've seen those, but yeah. Well, I feel the same way about the the new ones. And honestly, even those ones, because like, I mean, I don't know exactly how old you are, but I think we're like around the similar age. So like 35, the, the, 
the pre yeah okay um so those came out when we were like kind of kids preteen yeah. kind of age um because yeah. they came out what like 2000 i think i think right? we were in middle school i want to say yeah. yeah 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 and so to me and my mom was a star wars fan cool. um and so she got me into it like watching all the old ones growing yeah. up yeah. and so when those ones came out like me and her were just so excited yeah. Like it doesn't it didn't matter like what we're gonna see. And to yeah. us it was like it was just the fantasy of seeing a whole new world. So like yeah, mm-hmm. oh yeah. I fucking love Jar Jar Banks. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And all like yeah. in all the the like the production design, like the outfits, like Queen Amidala with the I yeah. think I had like a, a McDonald's toy of her that I loved. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you hear people talking about it after I mean, Darth Maul how was terrible sick. it was. Darth Maul was sick. You know, the pod what raising was sick. What a great villain. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. The pod raising. Yeah. There, there's, there's a lot to be, like, just the character of Anakin, too. Like, I thought he was cool. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I thought they were great. And, and it's funny how sometimes this culture can ruin it. And I think it happens with with games as well and it's like this kind of feeling of it almost goes back to you know you starting out in the industry and like only applying to those like five big studios not that there's anything wrong with them but you kind of have this image of your head of like i only want to work on the best like if i'm gonna work in film like it's marvel or bust or like if i want to work in games it's got to be call of duty because that's my favorite game there's so much content out there to be created good and bad and a ton in between um and i don't know where i'm going with this but but sometimes you know you you can just have a good time or have a good job or enjoy a movie without it having to be like some cinematic masterpiece Mm -hmm. like i'm famously like a huge fan of like i got an argument with my friend the other day about tom cruise i'm like oh i I love him like he's one of the greatest actors of my our time you know and they're like no but like he's not like an actor actor i'm like are you not entertained like (laughs) dude tom cruise is a great actor dude your friend's crazy (laughs) i know i know right oh thank thank you no Um, he's a great actor (laughs) he does play tom cruise but super realistically right i agree with you that it, it helps to be not so critical not so cynical and uh you know because yeah. these things i think it's best to enjoy them like right now on the air we have these shows like game of thrones and rings of power and it's kind of cool to hate this stuff um for whatever reason but mm-hmm. i am a, a a nerdy guy at heart that loves uh, visual effects and artistry and escapism and stuff so there's there's a big part of me that's trying to maintain the stuff that i just um had without trying when i was younger to enjoy this stuff and uh because that's what it's about people are working hard to make these things um and so Mm -hmm. it's fun to like chop it up if if you're into that but like i feel like more a part of it in a way that you know and i'm the target demo and like there's i feel like you have to try to kind of hate on it and then the way that it applies to what you said about games i think or the career aspect you know something we kind of touched on earlier but um there is a there is an important shift in mindsets that you either you either are going to be aware of now and and intentionally think of it and make decisions differently or it's going to hit you. But the impetus, the impulse for you to be following paths like this to work in film, to work in games, absolutely that comes from I loved this movie or I loved this game. You know, more than just people liked it. Like it changed my life for whatever reason. Like I now have a very profound emotional thing with this and i want to be a part of it and that's great because now you have drive but you're going to get to a point where that's that's actually impossible is working on something that already existed and if you go and work on those legacy products you're going to be disillusioned again like if if you love star wars then you would have worked on the prequels you know if you love call of duty you're going to work on call of duty 11 uh yeah. you know the <laughs> PUBG one or whatever it is so it's not real um and so I think it's important to to realize that, that like, hey, there is something that was so cool that drove me in this direction. I want to pursue that. But the actual destination is unclear. We have to be open to things because all those, all the people that made those things that we love, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know they were going to make that thing. They probably hated that project at the yeah, time. A lot of them hated it. it. <laughs> a lot of them hated it for sure. Yeah. And then it came out and they're like, oh, we're geniuses. Yeah, totally. We knew that. I think it really helps to be open to acknowledge the things that influenced you, but also to be open to opportunities and try to enjoy it, try to enjoy the ride. Like we mentioned about the first gig, there's always something to take with you and uh, you might get lucky 
uh, and then be a part of something that transcends whatever it is. But a lot of times it's, it's going to be a job and that should be the goal. That should be the success. If you're, if you're being paid in a way that you can maintain your lifestyle and the things you want to do by making art or talking about monsters or whatever it is that gets you excited, that's mm-hmm. awesome. You know, I think that is the more realistic, tangible success, which is also hard to get to, by the way, that's not, it's just more achievable than um, working on the, next big hit that you know nobody knows if people knew how to make hits they'd be doing it you know so and and, you know don't get me wrong there's still people that their first job is at riot you know what i mean some people get that chance it's totally possible but But you know just to play devil's advocate (laughs) i know a lot of people that did go to work at riot and not not taking anything away from riot they've made dope things but there are a lot of people they had thousands of employees so there are hundreds if not thousands of people that worked on projects bled for a project and then it gets canned because that's how riot riot does their incubation things so there's tons of things that will never see the light of day these people won't be able to put it in their portfolios they only get to talk about it with other rioters they sign contracts Mm -hmm. that they can never say what happened so for three or four years they thought they were living the dream and they had to act like they were you know like because what if it came out like they're trying to do their best work and then for whatever reason that is out of their control it stops And so I think it's important back to the personal work thing. I think it's super important to be able to have things that you can control and you can get satisfaction from because the great thing about doing these, having these jobs, I think the great thing is the collaboration that we can make. We can be a part of things that we couldn't make ourselves and we can get these really big things where all these talented people came together to make this thing uh, bigger, like the sum of all its parts. Um, But at the same time, you can't control things. Um, you know, you're just playing your part. Uh, and so where it goes, what happens to it, whether or not it's successful, whether or not it comes out, it's all out of your control. So I think it is for me anyway, it's been really healthy to have these other projects where I do control everything about it. And it gets that kind of stuff out of me where I can be more detached at work, where I know what my role is to be this hired gun to make someone else's vision come true or, you know, make art for other people. And whatever happens, happens. I just try to do the best I can do. But then again, if I can just make something, then it can come out and I get that little satisfaction because it would, if you put too much of yourself in, uh, in your work, because it's out of your control, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And, and you might, uh, you know, it might impact you in a way that, that you didn't see coming. Well, I think you, you mentioned an important thing of like actually getting it out because the problem with, um, working in the industry, like obviously the ideal goal for everyone, especially people starting out who are watching this, just trying to get their first job. Obviously, yes, you want to work so you can like live, you can pay your bills, you can move out of your parents' house, whatever your situation is, this is going to help you. But like you said, some projects get canned. They don't see the light of day. And then you just worked three years on something. And because you signed a bunch of NDAs, you have like literally nothing to show for it. Whereas when you're working on your own projects on the Mm -hmm. side, sure, maybe you can't touch something for three weeks because you're in a crunch, then you have to come back to it later and like find time. It's really hard. It's really hard to do your own projects because you're not getting paid for it. Money is like a huge incentive to be productive. That's why I always tell students like, Mm. you know, I think they have it really hard. Everyone thinks that being a student is so easy. And like, yeah, it can be if you're just trying to coast. But if you're actually trying to like get yourself out there and build a portfolio, like working for free, actually you're paying someone. You you said like, oh my God, you paid $80,000 to go to school. So think of it like all that work you're doing and not getting paid for. It's so hard to find that incentive and find that productivity. But yeah, if you're not doing your own personal projects, yeah. even when you are working in a studio, not that I want people to get burnt out, but you might not have anything to show for it. Then you're three years in project gets canned you try to apply for other jobs and you just have your like student portfolio from four years ago and you have nothing else that's new that yeah. happens all which, the which time happens. um people don't have time to work on their own stuff yeah. when they're in a crunch so you know trying to find time for those personal projects not yeah. just for your own um improvement and research and development but just to have something to show for it uh, I think is so important because you might not, you never yes. know like what's actually going to make it out, what you're allowed to share, what you're yeah. not allowed to share. And I've seen this happen to a lot of uh, people, yeah. students, like freelancers trying to get their start in the industry. They're like, I just worked for a whole year and I can't show any of it. 
you know, and that's so it's like such a hard pill to swallow when you know you've been working your ass off on something. For me personally, the personal work thing is has been the more important thing. Uh, so it's it's really important to do this personal work thing, as you say, not being paid to get the ball rolling. But then after that, I learned that the work I was doing in my off time for free was getting me the attention mm-hmm. and was leading to the jobs, which is which is not normally what people would think. And I think that's probably more common than the other thing. If you do work at like Blizzard, you know, those com- companies we mentioned, like if you do work on like, if you did work on the game of the year of that year and then it's in your portfolio, yeah, then you're probably good. Um, but still like it helps. I think personal work keeps you sharp. It also, as I mentioned, it helps you get emotions and satisfactions and things that you don't get at work. I mean, you shouldn't get them because it's different. It's for a different purpose. So if you are someone who um, is interested in trying a new thing and you're not given that opportunity at work, then you should, you know, why don't you try it at home? Uh, but also I think it helps you steer your career. That's how I've looked at it. Like if I'm working on a sci-fi-ish game or a realistic game, then in my personal time, I'm going to do different things from that. So it, it feels fresh. It feels interesting to me. It feels like I'm getting things out because maybe like at work, you know, you're given direction. Like, you know, you can't just be like, well, what if they look like this? You know? And they're like, that's not what we want to do. And I'm like, ah, good point. So at home, I can just do whatever I want. And sometimes that leads to work that ends up being interesting from other people's point of view and they contact you. And another thing I found interesting, I don't want to muddy up the water. If students are listening to this, I've told this to some other people too. It's just something that's interesting. What, but once I got examples that were production work, um, I stopped doing that because it's a drag doing production work, you know, for free. Ugh, like that is literally my job. So what I find more uh, enjoyable is just making uh, models and work and stuff, but I don't care about technical things. I just do it. It's fast and dirty. Uh, and it doesn't matter because it's not in a production. Why put all those kind of restrictions that take so much time? Uh, but then those, those works then started to become my most, um, you know, standout work. And I would get contacted from people. So like, I'm not making game art now and I will get contacted by game companies. And they're like, hey, do you want to make games? So I think that's a little f- funny. Like, I didn't think that uh, when I was younger. Um, we definitely think like, we have to do a character and we have to have the wireframe and we have to do this and we have to do that. As long as you can do some examples of like, hey, I can do production quality work, you know, um, that, you know, and people are like, yeah, we could we could use that in our game. We could tell him to do blah, 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 or tell her to shave off a few polygons. Then, then that's it. You don't have to keep doing production work that like could drop in it honestly it's more important that visually it's interesting it's shareable people you know it gets some kind of reaction so you can stand out from the crowd i think there's also something to be said about showing that you have the drive to just make stuff like there's there's a lot of these like underlying kind of personality skills or soft skills where people probably come across your youtube page and they're like, oh, this Jay Hill guy, he seems to be like a really like self-starter. Like he's going to work on stuff, even if someone doesn't tell him to. Like he's figuring out new stuff. He's putting his work out there, sharing work with other people. Like it's showcasing qualities about yourself that I think are really positive. Like that's something that I encourage students to do is like sharing knowledge because it shows that you're someone who might be good working with a Mm -hmm. team. If you're already sharing your stuff online, you're not like hoarding information and like keeping everything to yourself. You're like part of the community. It shows that even if you're not famous, the fact that you have a YouTube channel means that you have some kind of passion for the industry. Cause it's one thing I, I hate it when people do this, they put on their resume, like I love games. Or like, I, I'm passionate about movies. I love film and games. And it's like, sure, it's true. But so does like everyone. So do like millions of people. What sets you apart and like having a blog yeah. or having a YouTube page where you like review movies, even if nobody's watching. Like, I mean, obviously it's better if people are watching. Yeah. But like, oh, yeah. you know, it just shows that like, oh, I like this so much that I'm putting an extra time and effort into it. Oh, yeah. And I think like, it's it's like how to prove those soft skills or personality skills, that's like the key. And I think people see that probably with you. And yes, it's about the creative and the characters and the awesome things that you're creating, but it's also this idea of like, hey, this guy really cares about the industry 
and I want to work with someone who gives a shit for lack of a better word, you know, and like someone who's into yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of this, um, what are some other sort of mm. career tips that you have or what are, cause you've like mentored some people. What are some of the most common sort of issues or problems that you see come up? What is, what is some common advice that you give people now that you started doing this at this level? Uh, I'll just say one really quick that kind of tags onto what you're saying. Um, I completely agree that it doesn't matter the result, but if you are doing personal work, that's really valuable. Uh, when I would do interviews, there was this other like wizard hard surface modeler guy. And if we ever were on the fence, we would just say, does he do personal work or not? And like literally we could, we could literally hire someone just based on that. Because I think if someone has a portfolio and experience and you're a little bit like, can they do the thing? But then they're doing personal work. You think, oh, this person does it. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to not try to do yeah. stuff. They're over here doing stuff. So it just feels like you can work with that person. It just feels like they're trying to get better. They're trying to grow. And like as an artist, you just have this common language now that like, hey, we're mm -hmm. all trying to make better things. So, yeah, you know, come help us do that. So, yeah, I, I, I th absolutely just, I think that's a big habit to try and, uh, try to, uh, mm -hmm. perpetuate in a healthy way. And then, yeah, some, some common things I would say, since I do character models, I'll, I, I speak, I'll, I'm going to speak on that because that's my experience. Definitely the two that immediately come to mind. One is like biting off way more than you can chew to, to do a personal project and also like kind of putting it this kind of tie in together, but like putting it on a pedestal, almost like this is going to be my masterpiece. You know what I mean? It's that's too much weight on it. And I think um, that that ends up kind of freezing people up because uh, it's a long haul doing a character model. It's a, like a marathon. It's not a sprint. So if you, you know, those days where you wake up and it looks like trash and you're like, Oh my gosh, I have so much more to go. It's easy to quit. So um, I think building, so I'm always encouraging people to do mostly projects that take three days or less studies and heads and sculpts and textures, whatever, just things that are interesting that, and you could do things that look finished, but let's not do everything that's two months. And then, so you can kind of build up to like, or mix them in um, with these big two month things. Another way I kind of deal with it is that, you know, I've been saving concepts that I like of characters and sometimes something just hits me and I just try to jump without thinking twice. I just think I like this. I'm just going to go with that feeling instead of like really trying to like be in the lab and like, you know, again, to try and like minimize it a little bit. Like I just have an impulse. This is cool. I think this mm -hmm. is interesting. Let's follow that whim. And then let's develop that for two months. Let's try to make this really cool. Instead of like, this is going to be the thing that I'm famous for. Mm -hmm. I just think it's too much weight on it. And then secondly, the thing is, um, Similar to that, people that really want to do a standout work, people that are really excited, and these are good qualities, but they can manifest in like, they're just a little too early to do like the genius level thing. And they're just like, here's my character. I wrote about it. I've been writing like dialogue. I did these sketches and I'm going to do this. So like they want to make this whole thing where it's like a new story and a new character with a backstory and their own design, the hero and character. It's their own 3D model. <laughs> yeah. It's too much stuff. Like they're, yeah, they're literally like, this is going to be my masterpiece kind of thing. And so my advice is to um, pretty much always, especially when you're starting out is to um, start with a concept that's really strong that you feel good about. Uh, and for a few reasons, one is you're not a character designer unless you unless you want to be a character designer and then you should work on that. But if you want to be a character modeler, then you should work on that and they're completely different. And if you were to ever get a job character designing, then you're not going to make the model. And if you ever get a job modeling, you're not going to design. So it's not really even useful to try to do both those skills at the same time. And then also if you start with a very strong concept, then you can only go up from there. Like now it's your job to like plus that and you have a, a clear road to follow. Oftentimes when people try to make their own thing, they're just too close to it. Uh, and the weaknesses of design just interfere with everything. It's a mess and the, the road's not that clear and it's, it just, it just muddies it up. It makes it too much. It's already a lot. Yeah, just modeling is like a lot. And like until you're at that level, you know, it, it can be difficult to execute and then you get frustrated. And especially if you put all that weight on it, I love that piece of advice of, you know, not trying to make everything a portfolio piece. 
that's a crazy amount of pressure, especially when you're starting mm-hmm. out and you don't have that first job yet. You're like, how am I going to get paid? How am I going to get myself out there? And then every single, I see a lot of students do this where they think like every single thing that they work on is going to go into their portfolio. And that is such like I could feel the weight of that on my shoulders. I'm I'm even doing it. Like it's a huge kind of yeah. pressure to put yourself yeah. on and you don't get to focus on just making the art, you know, and sometimes things turn out well. <clears throat> and then you can be like, okay, I think this is a portfolio piece. How can I showcase it better? You I, know? I couldn't agree more. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. Something I guess I took for granted too. Like, yeah, as you say that, it makes total sense. Usually people are thinking, I mean, imagine that they're thinking this, if I do this right, this character could get me a job or this artwork could be a job. Like that is a lot. And, um, and that's my like two minds about things that I'm, I'm always trying to, trying to perpetuate this idea of if we can just get comfortable sitting in the chair and doing art every day for a little bit, for a few hours every day and just making progress, like just taking a step forward every day, we're going to be able to get to the places we want to get to. Like just, it's going to happen, not necessarily through osmosis, but just like you will get better. You will make things. Some things will pop up. You just can't plan this stuff. But the important thing, the thing you can guarantee is that you're just taking steps forward every day. And that is something you can focus on. That's something that you can do. Like making an artwork that's going to get you a job. I don't know if you can do that. Um, that's not a guarantee ever. You can just make progress. So eventually you will finish a work and then you go on to the next one and you go on to the next one. And then uh, if you just keep doing that, eventually it'll work out. I mean, you know, if you just put your back against the wall and you're like, if it takes me till I'm 50 years old, <laughs> then it takes you that long. Well, it's something that you can control, right? Like it's like... Y- you can do your best to try and get a job, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of other factors that you'll never see when it comes to finding a job. So like I tell students about this, it's like a studio, they're hiring a new character model or whatever, and you have all this stuff in your portfolio. You could be like the best artist in the world and you have all of these kind of sci-fi characters and then it turns out that they're making like an old timey Western, but you have no idea because it's under wraps they're not telling you the project they're working on and you've already created these characters you can't go back and turn them all into cowboys like they're they're done and so you're not getting this job because it might be amazing but it just doesn't fit the bill and someone else who has these kind of more similar types of characters gets it and there's nothing you can can do about that there's nothing you can do to like change what you did but one thing you can do one thing you can control is just like working at something and, and I think that it's underrated because everyone's like puts all this pressure on portfolio. But at the end of the day, it's which is the most important thing. But, you know, if you do something like you said, like two hours every day, just sitting in the chair, you can control that. And it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to get worse at something if you do it every day. Yeah, You know, it, it, it's like, you're not going to go backwards yeah. and start making stick figures or something like that, or like forget how to use Maya if you're sitting there yeah. every single yeah. day using it. Like you're going to find little ways to be faster yeah. every time. Well, you said that it made me think of something too that is maybe hard because when I was when I was younger, it wasn't as clear. It's still something I'm trying to figure out. But, and this is super cliche artisty stuff, but I really do feel like when I... For me, the um, the recipe or the barometer of like, this is what I'm going to do next. Like, like I have to just kind of genuinely be interested and have strong feelings about it. So I'm saying that because that's, again, sounds super artsy. But what I mean, what I mean in comparison is sometimes people without thinking when they're young, they'll think like, I need to make a certain type of artwork that will, that could lead, you know, they, they're kind of strategizing it in that way, you know, like I need to make something like Kratos from God of War or something like that, but they might not be naturally like, that might not be the thing that they care most about. They think they're just making mm-hmm. a pragmatic decision. Uh, and again, sounds super. We're um, changing the title of this podcast you know, to like Maxine's fluffy. cheesy quotes. <laughs> Because honestly, this stuff yeah, is kind of true. At the end of the day, it's cheesy for a reason. No, it's true. No, I, I definitely think I definitely think it's true. <laughs> and the thumbnail can just be this, you know. Uh, just I think this is it. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, it makes it does make. I'll, I'll finish my thought, and that's do what you feel strong about because that's what's going to be your style. That's what's that's what you can do to like bring some kind of edge. 
Like if you're just doing the thing you think you're supposed to do, first of all, that sucks. And then when you do it, it's like, okay, did I do it or not? But it's almost like you're an imposter. It's almost like you're doing work already. But this whole art thing, like if you are, if you can find a voice that's yours. And again, I know it's hard, especially when you're young, but you guys care about something. Like people care about stuff. If you think like, I don't want to do soldiers that kill people anymore. I'm over that. Then don't do that. Like if you think like things should look pretty, if you think things should like look like a certain style or, you know, if that you could tell, you could tell a similar story or a different character in a new way, that's what you want to go for. Cause even if people aren't making the properties like that, you, they, you might, they might get inspired people on the cutting edge because that's cutting edge stuff is like hey i'm reimagining this old trope like i'm or i'm bringing something new to the table that's what gets people excited and in those cases people could even see something in there and think well, let's try to get this in our project like this person care this like in, you know they might not have so many words to describe it when you see an artwork that's made by someone who like has a, a perspective like is doing something they care about like it just comes out more badass too and it's it's easier mm -hmm. to it, it kind of flows from you it's easier to work on it Cause you're just, you, you have a thing you're trying yeah. to say, you're trying to do with it. Uh, and it's not just like, you're like, I guess this is what I do. Like, you know, that's not, if that's your feeling, then you know, you're off on the wrong thing already. You shouldn't be doing things that you think you're supposed to do. Yeah. You should just be making stuff. So again, that's the, that's the weird frou-frou emotional way to talk about it. But I think you can compare like the things I compare most to is like acting and music. Okay. Because when you get people that are from the normal, you know, school system, uh, and their parents and everything are like, what are you talking about? That Do you go to school and then get a job in games? I don't understand. And it's not like that. It's more like music and acting. We're all competing for a small amount of jobs. So like, how does a musician make money? How does an actor make money? Like they have to find a path through and they have to, I would argue, be genuine, have a unique thing about them, and, you know, have some kind of authentic thing that they're selling that people want to buy more than all the other people. So we're a lot more akin to that, that there aren't that many jobs. If you just do whatever other people are doing, you're mm -hmm. probably going to blend in. Um, but we're all competing in a way. Music is a good one for me that I always think like, you know, some things just pop off. And I think, and a lot of times they're like, I don't know why it works, but I'm just trying to do the thing I care about and yeah. it's working out, knock on wood. So, and I think that's, I'll honestly, what it kind of feels like, in a, even in the other industries. You don't ever see a cover band getting as big as the band themselves, right? And so, just like you said, like, oh, I want to make yeah. this character like, like the guy from God of War, and it's like, but he already exists. Whoever made him already made him. Exactly. And so, if they want to make another one of him, they're going to go to the person who already made them. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not going to pick this guy who's yeah. making a bunch of fan art. Like, no offense. Sometimes fan art can help you. But in most cases, it's like, they already got the person to do that. You know? And similar to, like you said, musicians, mm -hmm. actors. No, nobody's going to hire Tom Cruise's impersonator. I'm just trying to drop his name as much as I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like, no one's yeah. going to hire Tom Cruise's impersonator for Mission Impossible 9. You know what I mean? They're going to hire Tom mm -hmm. Cruise. Like they're looking for maybe someone to like join him and be like the side character or whatever. But yeah, it's like just copying other people isn't going to get you that like next big thing. Um, real quick, I have a yeah. couple of listener questions yeah. because like I said, quite a few people from um, the school that I work for, CG Spectrum, really wanted me to interview you. And I said one, but actually it was like quite a few people, a lot. Uh, we're really curious. So I have a couple questions here from my students. Uh, first one, and I love this one. How do you balance your time between work, personal projects, and holding such a great YouTube channel? Super fan over here. Did you find the cure to <laughs> sleeping? Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, I didn't find the cure. I will say, um, okay, I'll give the, I'll give the answer that was the, that was the unique part. And then uh, I'll try to be, I'll try to give some practical advice. But, you know, I mentioned that I had this feeling of, um, Shame, that seems harsh, but like not, you know, guilt for sure that I wasn't doing the thing that I told myself I wanted to do. Like, why wasn't I? I was afraid of doing art and sucking, whatever. The thing that we're all, the resistance that we all have to sticking our neck out and doing creative work. So I was at the end of this 
you know, time while I was doing life stuff and, uh, and I was trying to get the ball rolling and, uh, the pandemic happened, felt like excuses are going away. And I had my daughter who's now two on the way. And I knew that, and I just, we just like life just kind of settled out. We're like, we have a house now we've got jobs. Things are good. Let's try to maintain this homeostasis. And I thought this is the, this is the best time uh, to try to do something consistent. Cause that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be consistent and I wanted to be genuine with what I was doing. And I was aware of this like parent or dad thing that was going to happen. And I thought, <clears throat> I thought I might be able to kind of catch that wave and, and steer myself in a positive direction, you know, rather than any kind of negative direction. So I thought my life's about to get turned upside down. Um, maybe I can settle into something that's a more positive, like, um, design of my life that I, that is pointing me in the direction I've always wanted to go. And then I'll have this new child to like, that depends on me and like a rock that I need to, you know, like, you know, you're just going to burn it now. It's, the fuel's burning now. And so that's uh, that was the plan. And that's what I did. So you definitely don't sleep and all the things, all the cliches say. And because of, how it goes being a new parent, you do, uh, it does shake up your life where you just get to design it now because all your habits are broken. Uh, and you just kind of slowly. So what I would do too, like there was a time where we were new, you know, we're new parents, first time parents. And like a lot of new parents can relate that you're just like worried that something's going to happen. Cause SIDS is a real thing, which is terrifying. Anyways, we'll get into it. But we were, we were doing these shifts where we would sleep three hours while the other one was up. And so for three hours, I was just next to the bassinet, making sure she's breathing. And that was my job. And so that's it. So you had to be able to like look over and focus and everything. So like we would just watch movies because kids can't hear sounds. Um, so I would just wa I just would watch movies on the weird hours of the day, not sleep. And I would just type ideas um, to get it out of me. So I would, so by the time it was time that I could like come back in to my room and do stuff, I was like itching to do it. And I had all these ideas, long list of things that I would like to do someday. Um, and then I just started, started to do them a little bit at a time and I barely scratched the surface, but um, yeah, just started doing it. And, and the YouTube thing, once I broke the seal on that um, people like the qu person ask, asking the question were so welcoming and nice. And um, I'm really, I feel good that my channel's positive. There's a lot of like-minded people out there. I have a discord community that the channel kind of links to where similar to the things we we're talking about, like we're sharing info, we're chatting about stuff, you know, we're just people that are interested in this weird niche thing where we can all just get together and be like, Oh, do you see the new blender came out or whatever? Like nerdy thing that nobody else would care about. Um, you know, blender does hair now yeah, guys, yeah. you know, that's like big news, whatever. So it was a way for me to get a lot of the things that I missed the like social aspect, the sharing info, um, trying to give back, all trying to get better, trying to, trying to set that example in a healthy way of like, you know, I, cause I really do. Th so art changed my life in such a big, profound way. It gave me everything. And it also kind of put me on this path that I think has been healthy for me. Like I said, I was kind of a delinquent. I could have easily just done stupid stuff forever and wasted everything. And I had bad habits that could have, could have been um, destructive. So to me, it's, it's a lifestyle and it's going to be this part of me uh, forever. And it's, it's done so many good things for me that I, I want to encourage other people to pursue those interests and try to find a healthy way to incorporate it in their life. Because I think it is something worth doing for, for some people and it might work like it worked for me. Have you ever thought about creating environments? <laughs> No, the environments are just things that characters stand <laughs> and so, in. So you know what? That's someone else's job. Someone else needs to do that, right? Give them a chance. Yeah. So I just <laughs> I like to poke fun at the environment people. You know, they're just the background, but we love them. So in that sense, why did you choose to be a character artist, more focused on organic sculpting rather than a hard surface modeler? You know, honestly, if I just wanted to pinpoint to one thing, it was probably multiple things. Uh, and self-diagnosing is in probably never that accurate. But for me, like the you know, if it if, if point to one thing, dude, it was the golem schizo scene in the two towers when he's talking yeah, yeah, himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. People know what I'm saying out there. That was just so profound. It hit me at the right age. And it was, uh, it was, it was literally, that's what movie magic is where it had the mixture of like, what did I just 
see and experience. And uh, I became obsessed with um, learning like how that was done. And thankfully, I still have them right here and I still watch them. Um, thankfully, the behind the scenes on those movies is incredible. So anyone that's interested in that stuff can have it. And they did that for people just like me, like Peter Jackson, the director has said, he did the behind the scenes for people that wanted to make things. And I'm so happy he did that. So there's a lot of info on it. And I, I dug deep and I got Maya because they used Maya and I started sculpting because they sculpted him and like learned how to do facial animation. Like I wanted to be able to do that. Yeah. It was so magical. That kind of thing. A digital character, like yeah. actually making you feel real emotions. I think that's so cool. Even if you don't get to work on the next Gollum, it's like that. It, it's okay for something to be inspiration and like and, and there and cause you to learn other stuff. I love that. Um, I think it was a behind the scenes for me of The Lion King that made me first. It was like my first idea of oh, cool. like thinking that, oh, this is a real thing. Like there's people working in this industry doing this. Like did yeah. I ever – I haven't even worked at Disney I've worked with people who worked at Disney, but it's it's okay for that to just be the inspiration. Um, what is, oh, I love this. What is your render engine of choice? Everyone knows that Arnold is best, but have you ever tried Redshift or RenderMan? Oh, yeah. What do you think about them? And you said something like um, Mental Ray. That, pers yeah. <laughs> that person sounds like a smart person. Uh, no, I only used Mental Ray back in the day because it was free with Maya and it sucked. Arnold is now free with Maya and Arnold is my favorite uh, because it's what's called uh, unbiased. So that, that means it's as accurate as possible. Uh, so it makes things that look real. And I think that's so cool, but it's so slow. So I don't do it all the time. And you have to author things specifically for that. So some of my work is Arnold. And if I were to pick an offline renderer, that's what I would pick. I super wish it was as fast as Redshift. That's the only reason why I've used Redshift before is that it's so fast. Um, but Unreal Engine nowadays is probably what I do when it comes to fast, just because, I don't know, I make games. It's in the real-time world. I use Unreal Engine every day, and soon it's going gonna, it's gonna to bridge this thing. They're doing offline rendering too with it. You know, don't want to go in the weeds. But Redshift is super cool. All the renders are so cool nowadays. GPUs are cool. I mean, just pick one, and you're going to be fine. Uh, I'm interested in all of them. But Arnold and... Unreal, I guess, would, would be the two that I would have to pick. Um, for beginners who are learning ZBrush and finding it overwhelming, what would be your advice? And can you suggest some exercises to improve in organic sculpting? The cure is just using it every day. Um, it would be like if someone's like, oh, I want to play basketball, but dribbling is so weird. And it's like, yeah, but if you just dribble every day, then eventually you're just dribbling and you're not even thinking about it. And that's what happens. It doesn't take too long. Like you just um, make stuff. So the two go hand in hand. If you want exercises, then I suggest making like from a sphere or a cube, just make like feet, make ears, uh, and then eventually hands, and then eventually faces, probably in that order. They get more difficult. But just those body parts are very organic. They've got all the shapes, convex shapes, overlapping shapes. They've got anatomy. They've got – you can tell story with them. Mm. There's character in them. You know, you can choose an age. You can choose an action. So they're, they're just the right amount that you can do them in a few days once you get comfortable. And all the while, you're going to be using ZBrush and eventually you're going to get to the point where – this is the goal. You just keep doing it where the muscle memory takes over and now it's like your mind is just – you're just sculpting and you're not thinking about – where the button is or what to push or whatever that's and that's that just comes with some practice and everyone can get there and then uh, then you get to think more about the art which is the fun part and then this is something that i specifically want you to answer maybe via email because i think it's going to be a series of links so everyone please check out the show notes after this but i'm going to ask jay hill after we stop recording, do you know some websites where students can deepen their knowledge about anatomy, proportions, artistic thinking? Do you have any suggestions for books? So I'll save that for after the podcast. Maybe you can share some links with us and we'll drop them in the show notes for after this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining me. This was so much fun. I could talk to you for hours. Um, thank you, let thank us you. know where, I mean, most people, like I said, you're like highly requested. So I think they know where to find you, but let us know again, where can we find you online if people want to see more of your work? Yeah, my YouTube channel, if you want to watch videos, uh, it's youtube.com slash art of J Hill. And that's also my Instagram. And you could go to artofjhill.com that has the links awesome. to all the things. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, and I can't wait to see uh, what you do next. And we'll we'll keep watching your YouTube channel. And yeah, thanks for joining us here. And 
giving us some of the behind the scenes. Hopefully it inspires someone else, you know, just like behind the scenes inspired you. And I hope so. Yeah. I love that. All right. Thank you, Maxine. Thanks for listening to the CG Spectrum podcast. For more on this episode, visit us at cgspectrum.com forward slash podcast. Check out our show notes where you'll find links to our guests and more behind the scenes. And if you're enjoying the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're listening or share this episode with someone who might like it. See you next time.